morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Michelle is here, so we can get started now. Good morning, Michelle. Um, Hey, man, I'm really excited about today. Um, We're still going through our series in the book of John. And I think that this morning's uh, the part that I've brought, I think it's awesome. Whether or not the delivery will be good or not, the content is great. And uh, I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited to hear from you guys, too. So um, I'm going to pray for us. And we have a guest worship leader with us. Um, Zach, the yellow dart Pfeiffer, is here live. And um, really excited um, really excited to worship with Zach. And I know you guys are, too. He's been here with us before. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be great. So let me pray for us. And then we'll worship. Um, through music, and then we'll have a time of sharing after we read our text, and then if there's time, I'll preach. And if there's not time, then you will um, have successfully avoided a sermon this morning. So let me pray for us. Father, we love you so, so much. Man, thank you for your grace. Thank you for um, the cross and the resurrection, we celebrate the resurrection today just as much as we do on Easter. And we're here because he's alive. And uh, we have hope because he's alive. We have life because he's alive. So, man, Father, this morning, I pray that wherever any of us are, that we could just be here in your presence. Um, whether that be through lament, through uh, worship, through confusion, through uh, sleep, <laughs> whatever, that we, that we can abide in your presence, that we can find your truth for whatever it is that we're going through, that we can find, find uh, your perspective on that. Let it, let it uh, wrap itself around us. And draw us into your presence with your community. Um, that through our delight in you, you will get all the praise and we'll get all the joy. So we love you. We're yours and inhabit our praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's all stand and worship together.
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art sing with me then sings my soul soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art, how great sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Thou art. Amen. splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Time is in his hands, the beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God one more time and how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all He's the name above all 
your God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
my heart and my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord, let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out Your will above all else My purpose remains The art of losing myself Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all things. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise. Thank you. 
And you came to my rescue And I want to be where you are I want to be where you are, Lord I call you answer And you came to my next part is my prayer. In my life, be lifted high in our world. Be lifted high in our love. Be lifted high, higher, higher. In my Lifted high in our world, be lifted high in our love, be lifted high. Pray with me. In my life, be lifted high in our world. Be Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father, man. Thank you for putting a desire in our hearts to be where you are. We were slaves to sin, man. We wanted to be where sin was. And it killed us. It chewed us up and spit us out. It broken, messed up, lost piece of this world and you died for us and brought us up raised us up unshackled our chains to that cycle and you bound yourself to us you sealed us in your spirit so now we're no longer slaves to sin but we're slaves to righteousness we want to be where you are And in your presence is grace, is forgiveness, is mercy, is freedom, is power and joy and love. Oh, we want to be where you are. We love you passionately. Let your grace dig in deep and purify us from those ruts in our brain that still draw us to the darkness for your glory and for our joy in Jesus name amen oh man um it's good to be in the presence of god that usually gets an amen i mean i don't want to manipulate you into amen you don't have to amen that you're free in Christ to amen when you want to amen. You don't have to amen me. I said, it's good for, for me to be in the presence of God. And I said it for me, not for you, and that's okay. Amen. Do what? That's right. You know, one of my pastors one time said, you know, we're always in the presence of Christ. God is always moving and speaking. But like a radio, sometimes we're not dialed into the right frequency. And it's, it's pretty awesome when our frequency gets dialed in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you have my permission to amen anything. That's what I was trying to get at, or not. Um, hey, so we're going through our series in John, 
And um, we're not just preaching through the book of John, we're experiencing John together, okay? And so I've been sending out commentaries on the book of John. Um, if you, by the way, the, I, I get the commentary from commentaries and books in my office. And if you ever want to look at those commentaries and books and go deeper on your own, you're always free to, to come in and I can't check them out right now because I'm using them. <laughs> but if you want to come by and read them, borrow them, you know, here on campus, you're always, always welcome to do that. I'm just sorting through the stuff that I, that I like, I guess, that I think is, I don't know. And I, and I put it on the commentary and send it home. And, and so right now, the commentary exists like this. If, if you've been here since round one, then you should have a packet with pictures on it. And that should uh, have you up to, um, like this last page wraps up verses six through eight, where we're going to be today. Okay. Um, now, then we have two supplements, and they're all back there on the, on the back table. The first supplement starts with the scriptures bear witness, okay? And it's front and back, so you'll get that supplement and add it to back here. Now, I know this is confusing, but this commentary is a work in process. Sometimes when I'm going back and reading through it, I find out that there are typos or things I want to say differently, and then so I correct it. So, and, and so on your first supplement, you, 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 you may notice that it uh, almost had it. I've been watching Matrix. I need to watch it a few more times. I would have caught that. Um, the bottom of this page, it says scriptures bear witness. So it, the, the first supplement overlaps a little bit to what's in the packet. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Sorry. And, and then, and then the, 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 the addition that is new for today is another two-sided page, and I'm starting to number them so that we can have it in, in our minds better. And so it starts at page 11 and page 12, and that'll be your last two pages. Now, the whole thing, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm updating it, as I'm updating yeah, so far, that's right. As I'm updating it, I continually upload it to our website in its updated form. So if you'd rather just keep up to date that way, um, then it's, you know, graceventura.org slash john. graceventura.org slash john. And the PDF is there for, for your download ability. Cool? Any questions about the commentary? So the goal is we all go home, we read the commentary, we read the passage, we pray about it throughout the week, and then... Uh, then, then we come back, and uh, we all we all have read through the passage. We've been praying through it, and maybe we have a word to share with each other. And so we experience the Gospel of John together. Okay, sound good? All right. Um, so let, let's read through where we've been through so far. And again, I appreciate uh, Sarah pointing it out that our, the translation that we read. And the service doesn't always line up with whatever translation you're reading. I usually use either the ESV or the CSB mixed with how I want to translate it myself. And so we get kind of a, a mixed conglomeration of that. Okay? So here's, here's where we've been so far, starting in John. So I'm going to read through where we've been and then give you guys an opportunity to come up and grab the mic and speak. And again, if you wouldn't mind standing in front of the camera, speaking with the mic so everybody can hear. I know Jean's at home right now, still recovering from um, uh, her, her um, procedure. And so um, it'd be nice for her to be able to see a face and hear a voice. But if you'd rather not stand in front of the camera, just let me know. I'll take the mic to you and you can speak from your chair because I would rather hear your voice than you not speak because you're afraid of the camera. Right? Okay. So let's go through our passage for where, where, where we've gone. Um, um, and, and we're focusing on John 1, 6 through 8 this morning. But, of course, you can speak to anything God's put on your heart from the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what God was, so was the Word. This one was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, and apart from him was created not even one thing that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent by God named John. This one came as a witness to bear witness concerning the light in order that all might believe through him. This dude was not the light, but in order that he might bear witness concerning the light. No, no, that's in the King James. That's the original King James. So the, 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 the mic is open. If anybody wants to come and share. Um, did you get the ball rolling? Oh, go ahead. I don't, no ball needs to roll. Uh-oh. I do know how to work it, but it was left on and it's dead. Brandon, can you look back there real quick and see if there's a 9 volt? Sorry, Donna. Um, Donna, how do you feel about getting on stage and using Zach's mic? Is that okay? One mic, is that a, it works. Will you can you unmute Zach's mic? Yeah, we're good. So we'll all walk up and use Zach's mic. that I'm sitting, standing here because um, this morning I knew that I wasn't going to participate. <coughs> Not working well. Um, so what I, I listened to last week's sermon this morning again, and what, what I heard most about was light and praying for our enemies. So uh, Thursday morning, I was in the cafeteria at the courthouse meeting with two women who pray in the courts all week long. And they had just come out of a courtroom. I, I had joined them for a meeting about a specific issue. But before we could get to that issue, they had to unload because they had been in a courtroom with a man who was on trial who, in their estimation, is a representation of evil. And one of them shared that this person who happened to be in a wheelchair um, has done horrific things. Tr he is like the, it's almost as though the court is trying to get this done. So they're putting up with a lot of stuff that you and I would think they wouldn't put up with. This person turned his wheelchair so his back or his side was to the court. And he was staring at this gal who prays in the court. And she was, she said she had her head down. She was looking at her Bible, she was journaling, she was praying. And she suddenly realized, what? This guy is not going to intimidate me. And she decided to look up and look directly in his eyes. And that's what she did. And after a short period of time, this dude took his sunglasses out and put them on. And she continued to stare at him. And the other gal who also prays in the courts looked at me and I said, she started to speak and I said, he couldn't stand the light. He couldn't stand the light from this woman. <laughs> it was amazing. And um, the other part of this is that their struggle was that they could not bring themselves to pray for this man. He is definitely their enemy. We, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but the enemy was present. And the thought I had, which I did not speak at the time because the burden was too great on them, but my thought was, then, then I will pray because I wasn't there. I didn't have the impact 
I could pray for that enemy. And I did in, in my own person. But this morning, not but and, this morning when I was thinking about this, I thought that's, that's what we're here as a family for. When we can't pray against our enemies, somebody else can come and pray for us against our enemies. That was good stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, later on we'll get to John 3. And after John 3, 16 comes John 3, 17 and 18 and 19. But that's where Jesus says, you know, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. But men have loved the darkness more than the light for their deeds are evil. But at, at, at some level, the Bible teaches us. Sin is having an awareness of light, but loving the darkness more. Sometimes we put on our shades. And I think we all do that sometimes, like in our lives, like we know what the light is. We see the light. But sometimes we put on the shades and we do what we want instead. I do. I Sorry, I know you guys don't do that. Sometimes I do that. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 Every hidden thing will come to light. Um, thank God that he's even in the midst of our junk coming to light. His grace is still sufficient. Come on up. You're the next contestant. It's actually really appropriate that Donna talked about being in court because to me the word witness has that connotation of being in court. And reading through the commentary, I noticed that John was a witness, the Father was a witness, Jesus was a witness, the Holy Spirit was a witness. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. Something's ringing a bell in my mind. So I went and looked it up, and in Deuteronomy, other places too, but in Deuteronomy, it says that a person can't be convicted with at least two or three witnesses. So Jesus was a witness of himself, and John was a witness, but without what happened when Jesus was baptized, we wouldn't have had as strong of a witness, but the fact that both God the Father and the Son bear witness I know he's not convicted, but he is affirmed as who he said he is right from the beginning. You're coming this way, right? I didn't know. Thought you might be going to the restroom, but you're just checking. I'm going to piggyback on what um, Sarah said, because when Bill and I were praying this week, you know, Donna gets, you know, she's out there in the world, and she is, she's in the courtroom doing that work, and I'm just so in awe of that. Bill and I sit in our garden and we rock and we pray together and we read through the commentary. And I was struck by one thing um, that where it said that the Father and the Son and the Spirit bear witness, and I'm going, okay, you made your point, bearing witness, bearing witness, bearing witness. And I'm going, bearing, bearing, what does that mean? I've spoken English all my life. What does bear witness mean? 
oh, oh, I get it. It's like a, it's like carrying, like you bear one another's burdens. So like we're bearing the witness. We're, we are the light bearers. We are the ones that bear witness. So we become a lamp. Each one of us is a little lamp. And hopefully our lamps, as we grow, get stronger. And that guy would have to really put on some, you know, serious shades. Thanks, Lee. Man, I really, I really, uh, everything that we've shared so far, I, I love. And, you know, all this witness stuff, you know, the word, you, maybe you've, if you've been in church, maybe you've heard it before. The word for bearing witness is marturo or mortureo. It's from the word we get martyr. Because the martyrs of the faith, taught, they, they bore the witness of the cross, you know? And so, it's just, and so, so yeah, we, 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 we bear witness. We, 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 part of it, I don't know, I have to look at the etymology of the word. I don't know if it's in there, but the content, the, the, the truth is certainly sure. We bear our own cross. We take up our cross, right? And then we, the witness is something that, that we bear, of course, that yoke is easy and the burden is light, but it is. I like that's that's good stuff. I focused a lot on my what I was going to just throw out there before the sermon. I focused a lot on on the the witness part too, because it is a huge part of the Book of John. And uh, one of the things that I, that I heard somebody say one time is that one thing that a witness does is that she points to the point. The witness usually, I don't know how this applies to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but I'm still going to use it because I like the, I think the metaphor works pretty good. But usually a witness isn't the point. In a courtroom, a witness isn't the point. The witness is supposed to point to the point. You know, like I saw it, right? I heard that like the witness points to the point. And John the Baptist knew that. And that's why he said about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. And so I said, you know, pointing may be rude most of the time, but not when you're pointing to Jesus. So we're called to bear witnesses and to point. James, are you stretching or are you walking the aisle? It's about time James walked the Baptist aisle, I'll tell you. Oh, you mean you know one of the things we talk about when we talk about and, and as Nick talked about the week about light and dark are not equal it's not yin and yang what darkness is is the absence of light and uh, so darkness didn't overcome light light ends darkness uh, just the presence of light, there cannot be darkness. And uh, as we were talking, why do people love darkness more than light? And I just thought back of the, uh, you know, the saying we've heard before. You know, one of the truths is there is a God and you're not him. And that struggle between who's the Lord of our lives, who's, who's our God, is it God or is it ourselves? And it's real hard to be the God of your own life in light. And I think sometimes one of the reasons why we seek darkness is because there we can be the God of our own life. And we don't, ha as long as God's not looking at us, I can run my own life, but it only works in the dark. Uh, uh, last week, something I thought about, but towards the end, I said, you know, uh, this is uh, using one analogy. Uh, are we, you know, the question gets to be, are we moths or cockroaches? Uh, and it, cockroaches, if you go in, if you have cockroaches, and that's a terrible thing. If you do have that, get lizards, get uh, geckos, they'll take care of that. But I've heard stories of people going in that had a problem with cockroaches, and they turn on the light at night and go in the kitchen, 
And what do the cockroaches do? They scatter. They want to get out of the light into darkness. But what is a moth's reaction to light? They're drawn to it. And, uh, and so I sometimes think in day to day, is today am I a cockroach or a moth? Am I trying to scurry out of the light of God so I can indulge in sin? Or am I trying to draw to the light? And uh, 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 Larry and I do a lot of talking uh, uh, about things like that. And one of the things he's always reminding me of is once uh, a challenge Nick has occasionally given us. He said, go out and uh, this week I challenge you to go out and see if you can sin. I bet you can't do it. And, and that's being a moth is when I can't go out and just indulge in sin because the light is in me. And, uh, and, and that is kind of what we're uh, struggling with about being, are we, are we going to be that moth? Are we going to seek the light and the light in our life? And so those kind of things uh, came to me. And uh, one of the final things of the witness, uh, sometimes people say, well, how can I be a witness? I don't know all the theology. I haven't gone to seminary. I don't have my dissertation you've done. <laughs> you know, all these things. How can I really be a witness? But one of the great witnesses of the New Testament, and we'll get to him in a few weeks as we go through John, was the blind man who was healed in John 8. And you remember the Pharisees, oh, I go, how can you how can you say he's a devil? He says, what is he? Is he devil that asking him about Jesus? And what did the guy say? He said, I don't know. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. He could testify and witness to what Christ had done for him. I was blind, but now I can see. And when you're blind, you're in no darkness. But when you can see, what can you see? Light. And so, uh, so sometimes when people challenge you about, oh, what, what can I say? You say, I can't answer all the theological questions, but I can say what Christ has done for me. I personally was blind, but now I see. Thank you, James. You're pretty sharp for a slow guy. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Bill. sitting there ever since Donna spoke and uh, it's a subject that uh, that I know a little bit about from personal experience there have been just a very few times in my life when I witnessed evil firsthand over 20 years ago a Washington school across the street had been an abandoned building for nearly 20 years. It had become a magnet for homeless people, etc. And I was over there one day beginning to do some work, and I ran into a homeless man that I rousted. He sent me some really bad vibes, but his voice, his demeanor, and his uh, his uh, general impression to me was of Charles Manson, believe it or not. So he left and I went in to clean up the area that he'd been living in. I found a stack of magazines at least this high, maybe higher, of pornographic magazines. And we're not talking about Playboy magazines either. I took a peek and I said, man, this is some really bad stuff. So I took it and threw it away. And I don't know why I'm sharing this, except that evil is out there. Many times evil is in 
very seductive in shades of gray and we don't recognize it right away. But when you really see it, you understand that we have a spiritual battle going on. And uh, I just felt the need to share this experience after I heard what Donna had said. Yeah, you know, I think that's, man, the point of our, well, a point, a point that I want to draw out of our passage this morning is that all this light and dark stuff and eternal theological truth stuff, like it is uh, real and not just like, not just like spiritually real, but like it's in the nitty gritty earth real. And therefore, the light <laughs> needs to be that, too. You know, man, we, we have a really cool fellowship here. Grace Church is killing it, man. It's it's so safe and fun. And But if all we do is huddle together and have great conversations about the light, John's, man, he talks, Jesus is the light. Oh, and we just, just you know, feel good about the light. And we don't take that into, like, how we wash our clothes how we brush our teeth, how we drive, how we treat people at work. Like that we bearing witness isn't giving a great testimony on a Sunday morning. <laughs> That's part of it. But it's how we live our lives. Because the, the darkness is real and it needs a real light, an embodied light. The darkness is embodied. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but man, that darkness is embodied. And then we need an embodied light in our town in our families, in our neighborhoods. Yes, ma'am. Jean can't hear you. So what she said, the one person who breaks the rule of the morning, um, I'm totally kidding. Uh, it was a great, it's a great word is, is that we're all only a few choices away from participating, reflecting the darkness that we shudder at. I mean, a few choices away. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. And th that's why we're called to be disciples, right? We're not converts. Like, yes, in one sense, we are transferred from the darkness to the light, right? We are crucified with Christ. We no longer live. Like, like, like he slays us or raises up a new creation in Christ, and we're new. We're, new cre we're not slaves to sin anymore. We're slaves to righteousness. There's something new. It's, it's totally um, 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 new in, in, in one sense. But in another sense, we still have the same physical brain with all of the the chemical reactions and, and, and neurological structures in it. And so we're disciples. We are training ourselves. We are growing. We are learning. We are practicing our faith. Um, I mean, we're in training. And so if we train in the light, we will grow in the light. Train in the darkness. We will still grow in the darkness even as believers. A habit's a habit. For a believer and an unbeliever, God can break them, yeah, but usually He works through the initial miracle of creation. How our brains work, how the physical reality works, is a miracle. And God usually works through His first miracle. Sometimes He comes in and does miraculous things outside of the way He designed things to work, and He can do that because He's God, but He doesn't normally do that. And so the Bible says, stop being conformed to the world. Be transformed through the renewing of your mind that by testing and training, you might discern what the will of God is. Yes, ma'am. Double dipping. Mm. 
little scary because I was thinking of double dipping as I was walking down. But <laughs> um, so what I was thinking about from what has been shared is that we can't argue someone into the word or into to belief. And somebody can always find an argument against what something, you know, a uh, written document, the Bible, even, I mean, I've heard that there are some people that believe the Holocaust never happened. You can argue about what we perceive as facts, but no one can argue with my experience. And therefore, the way I live and what I've experienced are what I witness to and how I witness. And I've had people say, well, Sarah, how come you never fell away like a lot of pastor's kids did? And I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to fall away when God is doing miracles in your life every day that you know without a shadow of a doubt are nothing but miracles. I once had food caught in my throat for six hours. And I tried every single thing I could think of. I, I've had that problem before. So I have a stack of things that I do, and nothing was working. And I reached out to my mom and said, can we pray together? And we prayed together, and instantly the food went down. And I'm like, there's no explanation for that except for God. And that is... You know, how can I not believe in him after having experienced that? And no one can argue about it. It is my experience. And I'm not saying we shouldn't rely on the Bible. The Bible is amazing. But it is what people see in what we do that is going to convince them to change their mind. Not however many words we can use trying to prove the Bible is true. I don't know if this is, if you've heard this before, it's almost, growing up in church, it's almost cliche to me, but some things are cliche for a reason, is that you may be the only Bible s somebody ever reads. So, yeah. Well, hey, I'm going to, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I do want to dive in to what I'm going to preach. It's, it's short, I think. Um, is that okay? Can I dive in? Okay, go ahead to our next slide there. So I want to talk about a lot of what we've already been going through, which is camel, uh, what I'm going to call camel hair witness. Um, John the Baptist is witness. Um, so I'm just going to dive into my notes here. Um, have you ever heard a Christian say something like, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. It's kind of true, but... I'm also kind of afraid that what some Christians mean when they say that is when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, and that's where my true home is. And by heaven, they have some kind of picture in their heads of a, of a city in clouds with ro roads made of gold bricks and really pretty bodies of water, a crystal sea. Maybe we chill on clouds. Maybe we're spirits. Maybe we have, like, spirit bodies that aren't really flesh. Um, and if these people are anything like I was when I thought like that, they don't necessarily have it all nailed down. They haven't really thought it through and analyzed it all. Um, and they haven't really thought about the fact that their picture of heaven is not really a reflection of what the Bible says, but really a collection of images from maybe sermons, movies, books, and other forms of Christian and pop culture. At any rate, in their minds, heaven is certainly something, something totally different from the world the material world is mostly inherently bad, and our goal is to escape this material world and levitate to heaven. And that's pretty far off from the facts that the Bible offers. It completely misses the point of Scripture, as if God's ultimate goal for us is some kind of half-material world where we exist in a state of half-vacation mode, half-eternal worship service. The creation story that John invited us into when he began his gospel in the beginning 
The creation story of Genesis actually portrays the world as the good handiwork of God that after God's image is created and placed in it is declared very good. Creation is, is painted as the house of the image of God. It's like a temple of sorts of the true God, and it's very good. So God's ultimate goal, his beginning goal, seemed to be embodied humans living in a paradise of creation in the world, in his presence. And the world is, yeah, it's now fallen. It's said to be fallen, fallen and ruled. The Bible says it's fallen and ruled by ungodly rulers and authorities, both human authorities and spiritual. And so we certainly want something different than the present state of the world. But nowhere does the Bible teach us to long for a disembodied, floaty, cloudy city in heaven. It's really not in there. We went through Romans. Remember we went through Romans? Here's what Romans 8 said. Go ahead. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. And what is that? The redemption of our bodies. So creation waits to be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we, having tasted of the kingdom by the Spirit that dwells in us, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Not the redemption of our souls. The point of, not only, <laughs> The point of all of what Jesus did was not to give us redeemed, disembodied souls. He came to redeem humanity, bodies and all. Go ahead. Whatever God's ultimate plan is, it includes the emancipation of creation. Creation is set free from corruption, and God's ultimate plan includes the redemption of our bodies. If you read the end of Revelation, where all the streets of gold and crystal sea language comes from, it does not paint a picture of God's ultimate goal as some process of teleporting his people up into the sky in some kind of cloudy, ethereal, heavenly city. But actually, the city is going to come down to the renewed earth, and God is going to make his home with his people who have resurrected and redeemed bodies. So in the end, God's purpose will have us on a renewed earth in a garden temple city. It's in there. Read it. I'm not making it up. So why does that matter? And here's why I think it matters, man. And I think it's, 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 it's kind of an assumption that, that, that we absorb. Well, it's an assumption that I absorbed as a Christian growing up in church. That, that, that I, and the assumption is essentially an escapist perspective on life. If we think all matter and earthly stuff is contrary to God's plan, if we think this world is just destined to go to hell, and we're just waiting to get sucked out of the earth before all the really bad stuff happens to those unbelievers, which is not really how I think the end times are going to go, it's possible to have this escapist perspective on life. Like our entire purpose is to sit here, evangelize to as many people as we can, and be judgy with those who don't let us convince them to agree with us. All the while, we just wait to get sucked out of the earth and taken to the clouds. And that's not the way we're called to live on the planet. And that's one reason why I love the character of John the Baptist. A dude was a trip. 
a true anti-institutional, anti-establishment prophet, but not an anarchist. Tax collector said, what do we do with all this that you're teaching? And he didn't tell them to quit their jobs because they were not of this world. He told them to be honest in their practice. Uh, to take their commitment with God and insert it into their earthly lives. He told soldiers, seemingly, I guess, Roman soldiers? I don't know. He told them to act with integrity and be satisfied with their wages. Old J.B., John the Baptist, he was a rugged, dirty, flesh and blood dude who called people to connect their faith to their daily lives. Weird, weird dude. He was hard to nail down, wearing camel hair and a leather belt, eating locusts and wild honey. That's in Matthew, not in John, but he did it. And even his, even his lifestyle was connected, it connected his message to the earthly timeline of his people. Uh, 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 his clothes were identical to Elijah the prophet. Check it out in 2 Kings 1.8. People were like, who did, you know, the, the king was like, well, what guy did you see? And they said, well, he wore camel hair and a leather belt. And the guy was like, it was Elijah. It's like, hey, I, I met uh, my, my, I don't know, great, great, great grandfather was friends with, with, with a, um, a really famous guy. Oh, well, who was it? He wore a top hat and had this really like killer chin strap beard. Who was it? So, like, it's same same thing. He, so he's even the way he dresses connects directly to the earthly timeline of the history of a people, and his diet reflected someone who lived in the desert off the land, like Israel in the Book of Numbers. He was earthy, rugged, blunt, and committed to his ministry of preparing the way, pointing to the one who would come after him, the one who would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For old J.B., the ministry and the kingdom and his life and the lives of all he preached to, it was all focused on here and now. Even as we wait for there and then, it was all focused on the here and now. Our faith happens here and now in the earth, and grit, and grime, and sweat, and blood, and struggles of remaining faithful in everyday life. Not just a baptism to get to heaven when you die, but an incarnation of your faith, even in how you do your job, even as a tax collector and a soldier. Our calling as Christians is not to bide time until we can escape and get sucked out of this world. We are to be a lamp that shines the light of Christ in this world, even as we wait patiently with the world for full redemption of the created order. So let's just go through our text real quick, one more time, and then we'll wrap it up. John 1.1, 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And what God was, so was the Word. This one was in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him was created not even one thing that has been created. In Him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent by God named John. <laughs> it just seems so weird. We're, we're talking about all this epic stuff. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and it was God. Everything that God was, the Word was, and everything was created through Him. There's nothing that was created that not was. That, there's nothing that was created that was not created through Him. Did I say that right? Man, and in Him was life, and life was the light of humanity, and the light came, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then there was this guy named John. <laughs> All of that super true abstract theological stuff has just suddenly been cast down into the dust of the earth like a meteor. All of eternity's purpose resides and resonates in the material world. Down to how we pay our taxes, how we perform our jobs. The eternal word speaks to how you drive down the highway, how you treat your family and your neighbors. Verse 7, this one came as a witness to bear witness concerning the light in order that all might believe through him. This camel hair wearing, bug and honey eating rebel 
situated and identified in the rugged wilderness where Israel struggled to be faithful to God in her earthly decisions, this dude bore witness to the eternal light of the world. <laughs> that light that has shone from the beginning in the life of the Word, the Word who was with God, coexisting as everything that God was, this earthly weirdo bore witness to the eternal Word of God. He stood wrapped up in dust and flies and sweat and hair and camel hair, and pointed people to the eternal truths within their own earthly lives. Verse 8, this dude was not the light, but in order that he might bear witness concerning the light. In John chapter 5, J.B. will be called a burning and shining lamp. A lamp is not the light, but it projects the light. Go ahead to our last slide. We're called, like John, to have a camel hair witness to the light. Earthy, real, embodied, incarnated, to project the light of the eternal word of God in our everyday earthly interactions with this world. And man, John's witness still burns to this day. Here we are, looking at the light that shined from this guy. And you want to talk about an earthy, gritty lamp? Not spectacular, not ethereal, not just some like uh, holy like guy in a palace preaching God's word. I mean, he had a nitty nitty gritty. He had a gritty, grimy witness. John's life was John was beheaded in a dungeon because a rich and powerful dude lusted after his own stepdaughter. John's life was snuffed out in a dark dungeon because of the lust and hatred of this world. But you know what? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not, did not, will not overcome it. His lamp still shines as a witness to the light of Christ. Our lamps don't have to seem powerful by the world's standards to shine Christ brightly for eternity. You don't have to be a beautiful singer. You don't have to be an amazing preacher. You don't have to be uh, 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 in the courts praying all day every day. God hasn't called you to be Zach, to be Donna. To, he sure hasn't called you to be Nick. He's called you to be you. Shine the light that he's given you. So, how is God calling you to bear witness in your life? I wish I could tell you, but I'm not God or the Holy Spirit. But I believe that he can speak to you if you'll listen. I believe he'll give you insight. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you perspective. He'll give you creative ideas as the God, the Spirit that hovered over the waters at creation, hovers in you, around you, beside you. He'll give you creative ideas of how to love your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, the people who cut you off in traffic. How is God calling you to bear witness in your life? Not in fancy evangelical excursions or church-wide outreach events and programs, but simply in the nitty-gritty of your daily life. What's your camel hair witness? Please don't come to church wearing camel hair. I mean, if God tells you to do it, I'm not going to tell you not to, but just really seek counsel on that. I'm going to pray for us. Zach's going to come and lead us in a song of response. And as always, this is your time to respond to God, whatever he's told you. If, if, if right now your response is sit and listen, sit and listen. Um, what, whatever you do, whether you stand and sing or sit and pray or get up and walk around the neighborhood, uh, whatever God calls you to do, um, do it. Let your response to God be a yes. And as always, I'm here to talk with you if you want to talk. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're online, you can email me. But let's respond to God and respond with a, with a yes. Let's pray.
God, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us enough to step into this world and not just play the part of a man, not just look like a man, but to become human. An infant in a manger. To grow up, to grow in wisdom and stature and favor before God and man. To sanctify the normal life. 30 years just living a human life. showing us, for teaching us in your ministry what humanity can look forward to and what humanity can embody today. That we can pray and practice your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, I pray that you would help us to do that. <laughs> help us to pray that sincerely and help us to practice that for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's respond to God together. You guys unmute him in the back. A thousand times I failed Still your mercy remains Should I stumble again I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory grows beyond all things. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the end. Inside out, let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. You will above all else, my purpose remains the art of losing myself.
control consume me from the inside out lord let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out amen man um pray that uh, you guys, that we move out after this time and embody the light in this world. Um, awkward transition to announcement time. Um, remember, if you want to check out our, our budget reports, our first quarter budget reports are on the table there in the center on a yellow piece of paper. Um, our missions emphasis for the month of April, this is the last week, is the Annie Armstrong North American Missions. And so if you want to give to uh, the North American Mission Board, um, they give money for church plants and all kinds of ministries in you know North America. Again, a few churches that we know, sister churches of ours, were planted through funds of North American Mission Boards. We know that the money goes to good places and works. And so um, there's there's envelopes there on the, the on my right. Well, when you're walking to it, it'll be your right too. Huh? So on the right um, little black table, there are some envelopes if you want to give to the North American Mission Board, if God's leading you to do that. Awesome. Um, also, we're, we're gearing up for our membership um, potluck. And remember, man, I was joking with somebody last night about uh, uh, they said that they'd become members of Sam's, uh, not Sam's, Costco. And I was like, ooh, step one, Costco membership. Step two, Grace Church. And uh, it's funny, it's a joke. But remember that membership for church is not like a membership for a gym or a Costco or whatever. We are members of each other like a body. And so saying I'm going to be a member of grace is not paying your dues and getting your benefits. It's saying I am going to be a functioning member of this body. I'm going to dive in as a pinky toe or Achilles heel. You know, you're our Achilles heel. Just kidding. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? Um, but we, 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 we also want to get all of our records um, straight after COVID and everything. So in behind the seats, in the back of the seats should be like a little card. If you filled one out last week, great. You don't need to do it again. If you didn't fill one out last week and you wouldn't mind um, updating your information with us, let us know if, if you're a member, if you want to be a member, if um, you've had uh, maybe one of the new members' classes, not both. Um, uh, so just, just, just fill that out and drop it in the offering plate on your way out. That'd be great. Speaking of offering plates, don't forget your tithes and offerings. God does not need your money, but God wants your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As a church, we pray over our budget and determine together how God wants us to use his money. And then that commitment is also a commitment to, to give to that. And um, so, so give as a joyful offering to God. If you can't do that, and don't give it. Pray about it. Wait, you know, and, and, and see what God does in your heart about that. Um, don't forget that tomorrow night, Mondays, 630, our Celebrate Recovery Ministry um, is going on. We meet in here and then break up into small groups. Wednesday nights, 630, our youth group that we share with Redeemer's Church meets across the street in um, the Washington, Old Washington School Auditorium. And Thursday nights, 6.30 p.m., if you want to go to the small group um, Bible study, co-grow at um, Bill and Nancy's house. Um, we're taking a temporary break um, for, with Munch and Meditate, and we will announce if and when that kicks back up. Um, any other Saturday? A week from Saturday is Crop Swamp. If you got any crops in your backyard, bring them up and some some dry goods, canned goods, and uh, we we swap crops. That's why it's called the crop swap. And um, also collect donations for um, where, where do we take the donations? The canned goods, River Church for their food pantry. Um, May eighth is Mother's Day. Don't forget that. 
And then our potluck, our members potluck is going to be May 15th, May 15th. And so sign up if you want to bring um, some food. Um, if you're not a good cook, you, you know, you can still, you know, maybe, you know, bring, you know, order out, bring some. But um, if you are a good cook, make sure you sign up for the potluck. I'm just kidding. Sign up. Even if you're a bad cook, we'll, we're loving. We'll eat it and smile and lie. So, so just sign up. Any other announcements I'm forgetting? Man, Grace Church, I sure love you guys. And um, it's been a fun morning. And man, man, kind of rich. It's kind of fun. Kind of fun being a body that can build each other up into the picture of Christ. So thank you guys. Um, anything else before I close this out with our blessing from Ephesians? It's crazy, this prayer that we close out with every service is Paul's prayer. Oh, I'm in Luke. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, Paul's prayer after telling the church, Galatians and Ephesians, um, that the church is called to make the manifold wisdom of God known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And, you know, the way they did that wasn't to be transported into the heavenly places. You know, I don't know why I had this. Anybody ever play Mega Man, the old Nintendo game? You know how he goes, bleep, and like bleeps out of the screen? I just had to, let me say, bleep out, and then be like in the heavenly places, like, hey, I'm here to talk about the manifold wisdom of God. You know, like, that's not what happened. It's in our daily lives we make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. It's nuts, guys. It's nuts. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter has got nothing on what is actually real about our daily lives. And so Paul says, you guys need a prayer for that. <laughs> so let's receive our prayer for our camel hair witness this week. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit toward your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.